This is a story about a question. What if we could change the narrative of South Florida? What if our community became known as the best place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Like our own stories, the story of South Florida is far from over. From the very beginning, the vision of Church United was beyond any one church, key leader, or organization. It was about the flourishing of South Florida, a belief that as the gospel saturates the region, generosity is reimagined, stronger families are formed, Sunday's faith is connected to Monday's work, art is more hopeful, literacy rises, the poor are empowered, orphans and widows are cared for, and commerce is redefined for the common good. So with that in mind, we ask ourselves, what if we began to connect, collaborate, and celebrate together? What if we began to unify around the spiritual lostness, the social pain, and the cultural brokenness of our surroundings? What if we trusted God for a vision so big that we would have to say it was only God who accomplished it? In late 2015, key leaders of gospel-believing churches began to come together, unifying for the sake of mission. We began to meet quarterly to build relationships, link arms, and discover the possibilities of collaboration. We focused on soul care, believing that healthy leaders lead healthy churches. And we've been mobilized to demonstrate God's love throughout our communities. But what if we're only just getting started? Today, we're writing the next chapter of the story of Church United. We call it Vision 2020 a vision to increase the number of committed Christ followers in our region from 3% to 6% through collective evangelistic efforts, planting churches, raising up leaders, mobilizing commerce, engaging education, and you. You are a critical piece of this story. No matter who you are or what you do, you play a central role in seeing this vision realized. You see, we don't just need more pastors and more churches. We need hundreds of new leaders who understand their calling and the power of their influence. We need thousands of gospel-saturated Christians, people who see their vocation as mission, deployed into every sector of the marketplace. And as a critical mass of South Floridians begins to rise, they become better neighbors, better employees, better parents, and better citizens. And that just might represent something big for our region. It may just spark a revival. Imagine when 3% of committed Christ followers become 6%, then 9%, and eventually a tipping point. And as the momentum continues, South Florida becomes the best place to live, a place of faith, hope, and love, a place where God's kingdom is on the move. Vision 2020 is only one of many chapters in our story, a story that is far from over. Join us. Well, good morning. My name's Eddie uh, Hopeland. No, I'm just kidding. My name's Eddie Copeland, and it's a blessing to be here with you today as we all open God's word and hear from him this morning. I don't know if you caught it in that video, but God's up to something really cool and really big in South Florida. Churches and leaders from across denominations and traditions are uniting for the sake of mission in our region like never before. God's people are uniting. People in our pews are uniting in new and unprecedented ways to display the love and hope of Jesus Christ throughout the city. So Hollywood Community Church, be encouraged this morning. Be very encouraged because God is on the move. As executive director of Church United, I have the humble privilege to share a front row seat to God's unique work in our community. Over the last year and a half, I've seen God bring churches and leaders together for the sake of kingdom mission. And I've seen your pastors and your leadership lean into that unity and sacrifice their time and sacrifice their resources to spread faith, hope, and love throughout Hollywood. So before we get going this morning, I want you to know how thankful I and the other leaders are for your church and for the heart of your leadership and for Pastor Brian. Can we just give him a round of applause for just leaning into that? 
Brian, it, it, it really is an honor and a privilege to be here with you this morning because you've been a part of this journey from the very beginning. This morning, we're going to look at John 17, a, a section of scripture known as Jesus' high priestly prayer. It's a prayer that is broken into three parts. Christ's prayer for himself in verses 1 through 5, his prayer for his immediate disciples in verse 6 through 19, and then his prayer for you and I, for all of those who would follow him in the coming centuries in verse 20 and 26. Theologian James Montgomery Boyce, and I think this is actually in your bulletin, uh, famously said this of this section of scripture. He said, this should be something to us of what the burning bush was to Moses. For here we hear God speaking, and we should put off our shoes and bow humbly, being that we're about to tread on the most hallowed of ground. So this morning we're going to specifically look at verses 20 through 23 of John 17, and we're going to spend some time looking at these three points. We're going to look at what unity is, we're going to look at why it's important, and then we're going to look at how it comes to us, or how can we get it, how can we experience it. So with that in mind, let me uh, read our sermon text and then ask God to join us as we open his word this morning. If you have a, a Bible or an iPhone or a Kindle or an electronic equivalent of the Bible, feel free uh, to follow along from John 17, verses 20 through 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who would believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Pray with me. Our Father and our God, we do bow humbly at this section of Scripture, realizing that this is your prayer for us. Father, uh, I come before you as someone who falls short of that type of unity every day. Father, by the things I say, by the things I don't say, Lord, uh, for my unbelief that that type of unity is possible, would you forgive me? Would you forgive us? And would you join us this morning? Would your Holy Spirit illuminate the, the pages of your word and may it illuminate our hearts to discover what's possible as you prayed for us this morning? Amen. Well, I don't know if you know this, but historically churches, or the church, capital C Church, well, they're known for what they're against rather than what they are for. We're known as the don't have sex before marriage people. We're known as the don't drink people, the don't smoke people, the don't cut your grass on Sunday people, the don't fill in your blank people. And not that any, so some of those things are, are, are bad, but like, that's just what we're known for. That's our reputation. Disagree with someone, disagree with something, leave the church, find a new one. No big deal. Disagree on something major, say like the uh, type of music a church should have, well, grab some friends. Form a 501c3 and start a new church and come up with a really creative name like Second Presbyterian Church. I'm Presbyterian, so I feel like I have that. We're, yeah, we're just bad at that stuff. We should not do church names. So I grew up in the church. I've always had a deep love and affinity for the local church. And as I've grown up in the church, I've seen the power of the local church. I've seen the church respond to homelessness and provide creative crisis housing solutions for homeless children and their families. I've seen the church leverage, leverage its resources to purchase apartment buildings to be used as affordable housing. I've seen the church provide for refugees. I've seen the church care for orphans and widows. I've seen the church unite in times of crisis to provide hope, help, and healing. I'd like to think I'd say I've seen the church at its best but I also have seen the church at its worst. But through it all, no matter what story you can leverage at me about the church, no matter what negativity, no matter what positive story you may have, I stand before you here this morning as someone who is deeply convicted that the local church, the church of Jesus Christ, God's people on earth are the hope of the world. And if they're the hope of the world, they're the hope of South Florida. And if they're the hope of South Florida, they're the hope of Broward County. And you see where I'm going with this. If they're the hope of Broward County, they're the hope of Hollywood. So the local church is the hope of Hollywood. 
It would only be appropriate then as part of my story as someone who has grown up in the church that one of my first jobs when I was 16 and in high school was working at Lifeway Christian Bookstores. Uh, sort of brick and mortar Amazon.com uh, for all the things that you can't find at the Cracker Barrel store with Christian logos on it. So uh, I remember so many stories. This was such like an interesting time in my life. I was, I was, I was 16 and I really needed that, that $7 an hour. So I was working at Lifeway like a good Christian kid. But we would get like the oddest requests from customers that would come in. Let me share some with you. I'd have customers come in, leaving their stroller and their children outside, come to the counter and say, hey, excuse me, can, can you please turn off Veggie Tales? We don't watch that in my family. And their, and their kids are outside unsupervised, and I'm thinking, you're worried about Veggie Tales. <laughs> or I've had people come and say, hey, can, can you please turn off the overhead music? It's got drums in it, and we, we don't listen to the drums in our family or music with drums. And I'm going, it's Michael W. Smith, I don't understand. But we'd oblige them. I mean, listen, it was what I had to do. I mean, we, we, we took care of them, and, you know, and I really needed that $7 an hour when, when, when you're 16 and, you know, you got to put gas in your car. But when my shift was over, and, and I remember getting in my car time and time again wondering, how in the world has the church gotten here? How in the world has God's people gotten here? Listen, if we can't agree on veggie tales, cute little cucumbers singing Jesus loves me to children, how are we going to agree on caring for orphans and widows in our community? How are we going to live out the Great Commission? We can't agree on singing animated animals, singing like beautiful little Jesus loves me songs. John White, former president of Campus Ministry InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, once famously said, considering all the divisions that have plagued Christendom for 2,000 years, it's amazing that God has continued to use the church to extend his kingdom on earth. Spend a week working at a Lifeway and you'll understand the power of that statement. But let me make that a little more plain. Turn on CNN or Fox News or scroll through your social media feed and it won't take you but one second to realize just how divided and angry God's people are. But here this morning in John 17, we find the last words of Jesus moments away, 24 hours away before his death. And we find him praying for you and I, and we find him pleading with his father on our behalf. If you've been around someone who is close to dying or is on their deathbed, you'll find that they really don't appreciate small talk. They aren't talking with you about the weather. They're not talking about where where'd you buy your shoes or I like your jacket. No, 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 no. They're talking about the things that matter the most to them. They're talking about the things that are closest to their heart, to the things that they value, to the things that they want to be remembered by. They're talking about their legacy and they're, they're talking to you from their heart. And that's exactly where we find Jesus this morning. You'll notice in verse 20 that at this point, Jesus very directly begins to pray for you and I and for anyone who would profess faith later on and call themselves a Christian. One translation puts it, I no longer just pray for my disciples, the people in the room here with me. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So from this point through the end of our passage, Jesus is very clearly communicating what he desires most for you and I. What he desires most for us if we call ourselves Christians, Christ ones, Christ followers. And you see what's happening here, right? We get a glimpse into the very heart of God. We get a glimpse into what he desires most for us. And if you're anything like me, I want to know what the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe, I want to know what he desires most for me if I'm going to call myself a Christian, if I'm going to put my faith in him. And to be honest, I, I've, I've really always pictured Jesus in this passage gently kind of grabbing my hand, kind of putting you know, his, his hands on, on my face and saying, child, please listen to me. Listen. I'm about to die, and I just have something I need to tell you. Would you please be one with other believers? Would you please find unity with them? Would you be one just as me and my father are one? Would you please be in complete unity with one another? That's all I want to tell you. I'll see you on the other side. But what is unity? It's our first point. What is unity? We're going to see this morning that unity is rooted in love. 
It's rooted in the very core of the gospel. It is a radical open-handedness to other Christians. It's a peculiar group of people coming together to share life, to share possessions, to share resources, banding together, locking arms for the sake of God's mission and God's kingdom here on earth. You know what the church is, right? The church serves as a demonstration community to the watching world if we're going to live out God's kingdom come and his will be done here on earth, here in South Florida, here in Broward County, here in Hollywood, as it is in heaven. You and I are a demonstration community. The early church, as described in the book of Acts in the New Testament, well, it spread like wildfire because of the aroma of their unity because of the aroma of their love for one another. You see, no matter what another person's history was or what their story was, no matter where they came from, no matter what they had in their past, when you encountered a group of New Testament early Christians in the book of Acts, none of that mattered. All that mattered was Jesus. All that mattered was their shared experience in Jesus. You think I'm wrong? Naked? Take my clothes, take my jacket. Hungry, have some food. Thirsty, have some water. Homeless, find a new home and a new community with us. Orphaned, widowed, we're here for you. What do you need? In debt, need money? Here, take it. It's not mine anyway. It all belongs to the Lord. And what happened? What does the scriptures tell us? The church exploded. And the Lord, what? He added to their numbers daily. Unity is uncommon love. Well, I know you instantly picked up on this when Brian introduced me this morning, but my name, Edwin Patrick Copeland, is half Greek. And you know, it instantly came to you, right? You're like, that guy's Greek. He even looks it. No, but seriously, I was, I was born in Athens, Greece. Uh, my dad was in the military, and my mom's Greek. He fell in love with a Greek woman, and we ended up staying in Greece. Greek was my first language. Greece was what I knew for the first part of my childhood. And uh, in case you're wondering, all, all the stereotypes of my big fat Greek wedding are 100% true. If something ails you, I've got Windex in my car. Come see me. I'll squirt you, and you'll, be, you'll feel better. No, actually, in my family, it was rubbing alcohol. Rubbing alcohol cures everything, just so you know. My mom put rubbing alcohol on everything, just not food, but everything else. But, you know, there's, there's something kind of funny about Greeks. Um, when a Greek meets another Greek, it's like meeting a long-lost friend. When you meet another Greek, you share this instant bond. I was in New York earlier this week, and I'm walking through one of the crosswalks on a busy street, and I hear people speaking Greek, and all of a sudden I'm like, hey, you know, like listening to them because I was like, hey, they're speaking Greek. Like I knew that world, I knew that life, and I just had to find a way to interrupt them and say something in Greek. And they loved it. Because all of a sudden, when you meet another Greek, not only does the room get a lot louder, but you, you share this kinship, this, this common bond. You begin to ask questions like, how long have you been in America? What part of Greece are you from? And, and this question that gets a little awkward for me, it's inevitable. Hey, what Orthodox church do you go to? Ooh, well, I'm, I'm Presbyterian. Uh, and they just look at you like, what's that? And uh, no, it's fun, but we share this experience. We share a kinship, a commonality, an affinity, all before we even know the other person's name. You're Greek. It's all that counts. You see, when I meet another Greek, whether they're a Republican or a Democrat, it doesn't matter. Our differences don't instantly cross my mind. What they do for a living, what side of town they're on, their vocational choices, how much money they have, it doesn't matter. They're Greek. Their identity, our shared identity, our shared experience as being Greek supersedes everything else in that moment. Ephesians 2 says, you and I, Christians, you and I were dead to our trespasses of sin, but have been made alive in Jesus Christ. You and I were dead to our trespasses of sin, but we've been made alive in Jesus Christ. And listen to this. If you're, um, if you're in this room this morning and you identify as a Christian or as a follower of Jesus Christ, you were dead and now you're alive. Let that sink in for a second. As a follower of Jesus Christ, your identity has changed. 
You're no longer a slave to sin. You're no longer under the weight of its judgment. You are a son and daughter of the king. Yeah. And you see, it's that shared experience as a people who have moved from death to life. It's that shared experience of being a son and daughter of the king of kings and lord of lords. It's that shared experience that unites us. It's that common, undeserved love that you and I have experienced in Jesus. You see, moving from death to life pushes aside everything else, and everything changes. All of a sudden, race and class and position and vocation and tradition or politics and money, fill in the blank, all the things that could be used to divide us get pushed aside and replaced by a radical love and new identity as beloved children of God. Christian unity is uncommon love that is rooted in a new identity and a shared experience of being a people who have moved from death to life. That's our first point. But our second point, why is this unity important? Why would this literally be the last thing that Jesus teaches us 24 hours before his death? Because here's the thing. Be sure to catch this. Unless the world, unless the watching world sees a radical, countercultural, open handed, loving community, the type of people that they don't have any category for, what Jesus is saying to us here this morning is listen to me, they're not going to believe in me. They're not going to believe in my message. They're not going to believe in the things that I have taught. Did you catch that? Our faith. The claims of Christianity, our crazy claims of what we believe, are rooted in uncommon love and radical unity and uncommon generosity. That's what Jesus is saying here. And our faith is filled with crazy claims. Let's just pull out some of them. Jesus died for you and I. Jesus is the Son of God. The thing a lot of people struggle with, Jesus rose again from the dead on the third day. You see, these crazy claims are the foundations of our faith. Without these claims, we have no business being here. We have no business calling ourselves Christians. But what Jesus is saying here is people aren't going to believe in any of that unless they see it backed up by a peculiar people united in radical, uncommon love. Yes. We need to evangelize. Yes, we need to plant churches and go on missions trips and share the gospel and work to expand God's kingdom. But none of those things are going to make an impact unless it's backed by a radical unity. Unless it's backed by a people who are uncommonly loving, forgiving, and gracious towards one another. A people who care deeply, who share their possessions, their resources, and their burdens with one another. We can talk and use our words and share our faith, and we can go do great deeds and service projects all day long. We can do that till the cows come home, but no one is going to hear us unless we have a radical, uncommon unity, a unity with one another that's rooted in love. Unless those people go, who are they? I want to be a part of that. Author and pastor Tim Keller, uh, when talking about unity, says this about our passage this morning. He says, quote, there is a positive and a negative to the unity that John 17 speaks of. First, the negative. Catch this. He says, the honor of Jesus Christ's name is bound up in the quality of Christian community. The honor of Jesus Christ's name is bound up in the quality of our Christian community. Let that sink in for a moment. Let the implications of what that phrase brings just sit. Another commentator on this passage, he asked this question. Do you know any churches that have gossip, insensitivity, negative criticism, jealousy, coldness, cruelness, greed, selfishness, backbiting, an unforgiving spirit, unloving, and general failure to fully welcome people who are different? Perhaps other races, classes, or socioeconomic statuses. He he asked that question of this passage. Of course we do. Of course we know people in churches like that. Of course we know Christians like that. I'm one of them. You're one of them. We all live this way time and time and time again. But you know what we're doing in those moments? 
And this is not to put any shame or any guilt because we're going to see that God provides a solution. But you know what we're doing in those moments? We are making the name of Jesus Christ ugly to the world. We're making them go, why do I want to be a part of that? We're making them ask questions like they talk about love, they talk about grace, they talk about unity, but like they can't even get along with one another. And when I go there and I share my problems, they they have no category for it. Can't do that. You see, we aren't in just in those moments gossiping or backbiting or participating in insensity or jealousy. We're damaging the witness of Jesus Christ. You know, one of the one of the things about my job is I get to look at a lot of research. And we have a pretty good spiritual temperature on South Florida. We've spent a lot of money over the last couple of years looking at research. And uh, the spiritual climate of Broward County is 3% evangelical Christian. 3% of the population would identify as evangelical Christians. And I believe that we can change that, but I believe that we also have to look at why that is. Because there's a lot of disunity. But that's the negative. Let's look at the positive. This type of unity, and this is where we're going to park a lot of our time, this, this type of unity has to be possible or else Jesus wouldn't be talking about it or wouldn't be here in his word. This type of unity has to be possible in the gospel, in the message of Jesus Christ. It's got to be possible. This type of radical love, this uncommon unity, this, this peculiar people, this sharing possessions and resources, it's got to be possible. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't be t- talking to us about it. Okay, so lastly, how do we get it? How do we experience it? How does it come to us? We've looked at what unity is. We've certainly looked at why it's important. We're going to spend the bulk of our time looking at how does it come to us? How do we experience it? Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book Life Together says, it's natural for human beings to meet each other and immediately begin to size each other up and compare themselves to one another. He says it's natural. He says you and I are constantly sizing people up and making sure that other people we encounter are not a threat to our self-worth. We compare each other on looks. We compare each other on status, on material possessions, on political affiliation, on vocational choices, on education, on money, fill in the blank again. You name it. You and I are constantly sizing each other up and comparing ourselves to other people. We do it all the time. But why? What is the root of that? Where does that come from? Why do we do that? Because I believe deep down, deep in our hearts, we're trying to justify ourselves. We're trying to make ourselves feel worthy, to feel valued, and to feel important. That's why there's so much disunity. That's why God's people are so fragmented and so angry. Because deep down, our relationships with one another are broken. But our identities are really broken. And I think I, I, I believe that Jesus knew this. I, I think he knew that this was the tendencies of where our hearts tend to go. And that's why we find him here this morning, hours away from his death, pleading with his father, praying for us, praying for unity, because he knew this is my heart and this is your heart. But thankfully, Jesus doesn't leave us in our relational brokenness. He doesn't leave us with fragmented Identities. He provides a solution, a solution that transforms us, that transforms you and I, and enables us to have a radical open-handedness with other Christians. It enables us to have a radical unity and love and relationship with one another. And that takes us to the last sentence of verse 23. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Unity is rooted in love. Christian unity is, is, is rooted in the fact that you and I have moved from death into new life together. We have a shared experience. And let's be sure to catch this last point here because it's going to take us right into the heart of the gospel the essential message of Jesus Christ. The unity that we're talking about here this morning is rooted in the fact that Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, creator of the universe, loves you and I more than we could ever dare dream or imagine. That's the root of this unity. 
This unity is possible right now because if you are in Jesus Christ, here is what you believe. Here is what we believe as Christians. Here's what unites us, that God in this moment, right now, loves us as much as he loves his son. It's the end of verse 23. That reality changes everything. But do you believe that? Do you live in light of that? Do you know that, do you know and if do you you believe that if you are sitting in these pews right now as someone who has put their faith and trust in Jesus, that he, Jesus, is looking down from heaven and he's beaming with joy. He can't believe that you're his because he sees his son and he'll do anything for his son. He loves you more than you could ever dare dream or imagine. Here's the thing. He's not interested in what you've done right. He's not interested in what you've done wrong. He's simply interested in rejoicing over you in the fact that you are his and that you belong to him. If you've repented of your sin, if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, you've moved from death into new life. He's given you a new name. He calls you son. He calls you daughter. I have three young kids. I have a three and a half year old, a one and a half year old, and a one month old. It's a party at my house. I'm changing a lot of diapers and not sleeping a whole lot. I think I've drank three coffees already this morning. So I tend to talk fast with all that caffeine. But let me tell you, I would do anything for my kids. When I get home from work, my two kids are at the door waiting for me. And they're giving me hugs. And it's, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And when I give them a hug, they have no idea how much I love them. That's Jesus. He's waiting at the door for you when you get home. He's in this moment giving you a hug if you are in him. And he's saying, I love you so much. You have no idea. Would you rest in that? Would you rest in that identity? You see, Jesus gave up everything to have you. He gave up all the freedoms that he experienced in heaven. He came down to earth. He lived the life that you and I were meant to live and ultimately died a death that you and I deserved. All that we could be his, all because he loves us. Friends, listen, this is what makes unity possible. You and I belong to Jesus. Your friend, who's sitting next to you this morning, who may have voted for Donald Trump and and watches Fox News. They belong to Jesus. Your other friend on the other side of you who may have voted for Hillary Clinton and watches CNN, you guessed it, they belong to Jesus. Because, you see, it's not about what you do. It's not about what you don't do. It's not about what political affiliation you have. It's not about what you know or what you don't know or the fact that you sprinkle babies and I baptize them or whatever else we could find to, to, to find disunity. It's about whose you are and to whom you belong. You are Jesus's and you belong to him and that supersedes everything. Our identity changes everything. We can push aside everything else because you're a Christian. You've moved from death into new life. Why am I arguing with you about things that don't matter? We're going to spend eternity together. Why don't we just kick it off now? If you're a Christian, if you are someone who has put their faith and trust in Jesus, then you belong to him, and that reality changes everything. So we're going to spend a little bit of our last time here. That reality changes everything. And friends, listen to this. To the degree that you believe that, to the degree that you live in light of that reality and let that sink in and daily repent of your unbelief of that and my unbelief of that and begin to reorient our hearts, our minds, and our lives to that reality, the fact that Jesus changes everything, our shared identity changes everything, to the, to the degree that you believe that, will you have the ability to have a new life and new relationships with other people, especially people that you differ with. Especially those that you differ with. Living in light of God's immense love for you and I is what makes our unity possible and what fuels the efforts of the video that you watched this morning. None of that's possible without living in light of Jesus because there's people, there's over 150 pastors that are part of Church United and there's people in that room that I disagree with. There's some that I really disagree with theologically. 
Nothing crazy, but I'm, I'm a Presbyterian, so like I have my own kind of set of beliefs and what I would feel that scriptures have compelled us to believe. But you know what? I'm not going to argue with my brothers and sisters on some of the other sides because they're a Christian. I have a shared commonality with them. We have a shared mission together. Sure, do we believe some things that are different, but ultimately I believe I'm going to see them in heaven because if they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they've moved from death into new life, and that's what fuels Church United. It's what fuels the efforts of our evangelism, our church planting, our education forums, our faith and work initiatives. Everything that you heard in that video is fueled by a radical, uncommon love and unity for one another. It's fueled by an aroma of something really peculiar that's happening in South Florida. You see, that love that we experience in the cross, it changes everything. It transforms you and I and enables us to be agents of kingdom transformation. The more that we live in light of our identities as people who have passed from death to life, the more that we dig into that fact and let our minds ponder that gospel reality that you and I are sons and daughters of the King of kings and Lord of lords, are we free to love others? Again, especially those who are different than us. You see, living in light of our shared identity, of our shared experience as sons and daughters of Jesus allows us another thing. It allows us the freedom and the ability to just breathe, to rest. It gives us the security that we need to be wrong about certain things, to share our possessions, to give away power, to return authority, to bear one another's burdens. If our identity is in Christ, then we have nothing to fear. Resting in our shared experience as a people who have moved from death to life, resting and finding life in our identities as sons and daughters of the King fuels radical, uncommon love and motivates open-handedness towards others. Now all of a sudden, that church plant down the street moves from a threat to a celebration. All of a sudden, the efforts or the ideas of partnering with other churches who may be a little different than you to see that number go from 3% to 6% goes from, yeah, that, 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 that would be, that'd be nice, but uh, Eddie's Presbyterian and he sprinkles babies. I can't partner with that. It moves from that to how do we make that happen? What do I need to sacrifice? What do I need to give up to, to experience that partnership? How do I need to repent to those pastors? How do I need to come and say, hey, listen, we've done this wrong. And I'm telling you, that 3% number, the watching world knows that we're doing something wrong. But that love, that uncommon generosity, that shared experience enables us to look past some of those things and to say, how can we work together to expand God's kingdom to the watching world? And friends, i got to tell you, this type of uncommon love and unity is slowly happening through Church United here in South Florida. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. You may have heard of our Love South Florida initiative. We kicked it off last November, and that's where uh, some of the churches that, that participate in Church United, uh, they do all of their outreaches or they do a collective outreach with one another every November. We kicked it off last year. Our tagline was pray, give, and serve. Could our churches pray for their cities, pray for their people? Could they give $39 a person? And could they serve at least three hours? And we, we thought, you know what, we'll pilot this, we'll see. I, I don't really feel comfortable doing that, but we'll just see what happens. This is our first year. You know what happened? We raised $250,000. We collected 50,000 pounds of food, and we logged over 20,000 volunteer hours. But that was last year. What are we, like halfway through? We're halfway through November. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're halfway through November this year, and guess what? We've doubled that already. That's what's possible with unity. But it gets better. Oh, wait, there's more. So this wasn't actually part of my sermon. I'm going to tell you sort of what happened just yesterday. So we're in the midst of Love South Florida. We're in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, we've shut down uh, two blocks, actually, two city blocks of, of Fort Lauderdale. And we partnered with Rebuilding Together Broward County. We partnered with the Fort Lauderdale Police Department, the Home Depot Foundation, and six churches in the east side of Fort Lauderdale all came together to rehab nine houses. So we're out there, and we're, we're painting, we're spreading mulch. You know, Home Depot gave $60,000. The secular organization gave $60,000 towards these efforts. 
We're out there, we're having a great time, we're doing some light home repair, you know, we're fixing doors, making sure stuff locks, and I'm walking around, I'm taking pictures, I'm shaking hands, thanking people left and right, and then I come to one house and I see there's a group of volunteers just kind of all standing around going like this and looking at the house. And I gotta, I'll gotta, i admit this to you, for a second I was like, what are you doing? Go, go, like stop, go do something, you look bad. So I kind of, you know, kind of nudge my way into that, like, hey, what's going on here? And uh, guy leans over to me and he goes, hey, uh, what do you think a new roof for that house would cost? And I go, I, I don't know, I mean, at most $15,000. It's was a little house in an impoverished neighborhood. And so a volunteer that he just met says, hey, I'm in for 5000 Another volunteer says, I'm in for 1000 A couple of other volunteers who just met each other, not even two hours ago, says, hey, I'm in for a couple hundred bucks. Here, take 20 And we begin to collect money for this lady to get a new roof. And here's what happened. This is only something the Holy Spirit can do because literally behind us at this moment is another volunteer from another church that is not wearing her work hat. She comes up to me and she says, hey, hey, I'm the community liaison officer for a local roofing company. I can get my company involved. And no, so Miss Phyllis doesn't know this yet, but she's getting a new roof for Christmas. But wait, there's more. If you call right now, you get two. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> churches are supporting other churches outside their denominations and tribes like never before. Pastors are caring for other pastors in really special and fun ways. Just last week, uh, I had a pastor I was sitting with, um, runs a great church in a low-income neighborhood, and he's just sharing with me. He's got all kinds of dental problems. He needs implants. He needs dental surgery. And he starts crying because he's in pain. And he can't eat that well. And he says, I don't have dental insurance. You know, I, I'm a bivocational pastor. I, I, I can't, I just can't do it. I go back to my office. I write one email, and another church paid for that. So now he's going to get implants. He's going to fix his mouth. It's not on the news. It's not on our social media feed. It's quiet. It's under the radar. It's Acts 2 type stuff. The church caring for one another, bearing each other's burdens. Just a couple more weeks ago, I had another pastor get his car stolen. And this wasn't even something I thought of. He says, I got an email from a couple other pastors that saying, hey, we've been talking and we want to buy that guy a new used car because I know he can't afford a new car right now. That's when you know it's starting to spread, when it's not our ideas from the back office, when other pastors are starting to get it and starting to ask questions of how can they pastor their city, how can they pastor one another. Because that type of aroma is really attractive. Not only is it attractive to the church, it's attractive to the watching world. Earlier this year, there was a horrific shooting at the Fort Lauderdale airport. And uh, we didn't get a whole lot of press for this. We got some, but I'd rather actually that we didn't get any because here's what happened. 24 hours after that shooting, Church United raised all the money it needed to care and pay for all the medical expenses for all 54 victims that were treated as a result of that shooting. <laughs> you see, that's what happened. That's something you guys should be proud of because your church was part of that story. Your church was one of the 52 churches that emailed and said, we're in, what do you need? That type of unity, that type of radical open-handedness is what John 17 is talking about. And it's not just money, guys. It's caring for one another and bearing each other's burdens. But you know what happened after the airport shooting that really no one knows about? The CEO of Broward General called me. I had a voicemail in my office. I had no idea who he was. And he says, could you call me back? And I'm thinking, oh, great, we're in trouble. You know, he found out the church did this. Great. So he says, hey, I got one question for you. He goes, I'm not a church guy. Um, why did you do that? He goes, what's the angle? So there's, there's no angle. We just really wanted to care and love for these people. We're, we're not sending them, you know, letters in the mail and inviting them to our, we just wanted to care for them and bless them in Jesus' name. You know what happened? He asked me to write a letter that he could put on Broward General's letterhead to send a letter to all 54 people saying that the churches of Broward County paid your bill. That's the aroma of unity. That is the aroma of love. So in closing, I, I want to ask you a question. I want you to imagine with me what could be possible 
as more and more people begin to move from death into new life. I want you to imagine what's possible as more and more people begin to rest and live in light of their new identities as sons and daughters of the king. You know what I think is going to happen if we keep this up? We slowly become a people. We slowly become a capital C church community that's known for radical, uncommon love, open-handedness, and generosity. We become known as a peculiar people to the watching world, but the watching world wants to be a part of that, but they don't know why quite yet. But why? Because as the church of Jesus Christ continues to unite together, As people within our pews begin to look at their lives differently, they begin to look at their vocations differently, they begin to align with a lot of the things that we have talked about this morning, something greater happens. The narrative of South Florida begins to change. The spiritual, cultural, and social climate of South Florida begins to radically, slowly, subvertly change. Because we become known as better friends, better employees, better neighbors, better parents, and better citizens. But why? Because Jesus changes everything. Because Jesus loves you and I more than we could ever dare dream or imagine. Because right now, if you are in Christ, if you are someone who's put your faith in him, he loves you as much as he loves his son. You're his daughter. You're his son. If you're in, you're, if you're in this room this morning and you're wondering, what is that? How do I do that? Would you come talk with me afterwards? I'd love to tell you more. Would you come talk to Pastor Brian or one of your pastors here? We want you to move from death into new life because Jesus died for you. Yes, we have some radical claims of our faith. Yes, we have some crazy things that we believe. But he did that. He did that for you and I. He suffered the death that we were called and deserved to die because he loves us so much. John 3, 16, let's keep it really basic. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Hollywood Community Church, if you've not experienced everlasting life, there's new life in Jesus. There's death and then there's life. And that life that sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross, our shared experience, our shared identity as people who live in light of that, that's what makes unity possible. That's what makes everything we've talked about this morning possible. And that's what I want to leave you on this morning. Rest. Rest in your identity as a son and as a daughter. Let's pray. Jesus, we come before you and we are so grateful that you love us. We're so grateful that right now, if we're in you, you are smiling at us no matter what we've done or left undone. You love us more than we could dare dream or imagine. So God, we thank you for that and we know that we are undeserving of that. Father, I come before you this morning as someone who needs to confess his daily unbelief of that, how often I forget that. But Father, you love me and you continue to pursue me. You continue to pursue us anyway. Your scriptures tell us that your mercies and your grace are new every morning. So, Father, as your son, we as your daughters, we thank you. Thank you for loving us. Would we love one another? Would you move through your people? And would the church of Jesus Christ be the hope of South Florida, the hope of Broward County, and the hope of Hollywood? Amen. Brian.